So welcome to Fashion for Goods Meet the Innovators event. And thank you for everyone for joining us today. Uh, in this session, we're really exploring what a brave new world for fashion looks like when innovation and sustainability are both becoming ever more important and what that means for the future of the industry and really how companies are operating. Um, and the agenda for today, um, I think next slide, Sophie, we'll first be having with us a lovely guest, Lise Bateri from Vivo Barefoot for a short fireside chat. And then in the second segment, we'll be introducing a few of our cutting edge innovations in the space, followed by a discussion and Q&A session for all of our speakers. Um, and before we really get going, I just, I think we'd love to understand who's in the call with us today. Um, and my, and my colleague Sophie will be putting up a quick poll for this. And while you fill that up, I think, just wanted to remind all of you to please drop any questions you have in the Q&A session throughout, throughout, the, um, throughout our discussion today, and we'll ask as many as we can um, at the end of our session. And the results are in. So we have a bunch of students on the call. Um, and I think also quite a few sort of manufacturer and multi-stakeholder organization employees. So pretty exciting little mix. Um, and I think we can then dive right in. So our first session for today, you know, is really welcome um, to, was really a conversation with Lee and probably a bit of a background on Lee before we start. Lee Spiteri is a performance and innovation designer at Vivo Barefoot. He chooses to describe himself as a self-confessed nerd with a keen interest in the natural world, science fiction and design. And after studying automotive design at Coventry University, he moved into footwear after an apprenticeship at Reebok, and I think has never looked back. Um, he works on a bunch of exciting projects now at Vivo Barefoot, and I'm sure we'll hear about some of them during our conversation. Welcome you again, Lee. Thank you so much for joining us today. So, yeah. <laughs> so sort of to kick off today's questions, I think um, you did tell us that you found the perfect role Right, so you and people barefoot. Um, and maybe why don't you tell us a bit more about how you, why you feel that way? Yeah, so um, I've been at Vivo for nearly four years now, and the time has, has really, really flown by. It's been a bit of a whirlwind of, of learning, being thrown in the deep end in, in many respects. Um, and yeah, I, I would say it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful place for me personally <clears throat> to, uh, to, you know, to, to spend my design hours, really. So, um, the, the, you know, the, the top things for me when I first joined was that it's really like, it's the company's approach um, to problems that, that, that are in front of it. So every brief that we work on, um, you know, it, 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 the approach is, is very different from other companies I've worked at where maybe value engineering or cost reduction is, is absolutely king. Um, it was quite refreshing to come into a company where actually the values are, well, no, how do we make a better product? What, what can we put into this or take out of this product to make it more sustainable or, or better better at the end of its life or you know whatever these different um optimization pieces were um and in the, you know the almost four years that i've been here i can say that we've been on a, a pretty intensive learning curve and i'm really happy to be part of that we've been through different phases of growth stability and then rapid growth again and and every new phase comes with its own set of challenges um so it's really yeah it's, it's it's really refreshing to be at a company where yeah there, there's this sort of mentality there's there's lots and lots of ideas tons of ideas flowing from every department not just from product which again is a lovely thing about vivo it's everyone across the business is encouraged to um follow the kind of company values one of which being innovating sustainably so it's easy to think of innovation as, as product driven because it's just easy that's where marketing has always told us to be but you know, innovation can be across the business in, in any, you know, many, many different forms from simple, simple pieces, just from how the office works through to, you know, some crazier, bigger projects like launching whole new silos of product, for example. Um, and yeah, we, we are still a small team as well. There's only 68 people within the whole of Vivo, um, only seven of which are in a product team. So a small team like this means you're allowed to, you can be a bit more nimble and work on other stuff that's kind of outside of your bubble, which I think is wonderful for innovation and, and innovative thinking because you see a little bit of this and you see a little bit of that and you can kind of mold your own little, little way through it. So yeah, interesting place to be for sure. 
Yeah, plugging a bunch of different things together. Um, and that's interesting. So you did speak about the company's approach to problems and why that's different, but sort of what does that mean for sustainability at Vivo, like a little more tangibly? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, sustainability specifically, it's, it's hard to separate the two because everything we're trying to do is, is on this mission to become regenerative. So everything we do is mission-based and yeah, everyone has to reconnect back to that. So, so the why, the how and the what, the why being to reconnect people and planet, uh, to reconnect people in the natural world, the how being to inspire a world with less padding and more feeling, and the what being to create regenerative footwear and experiences that allow us to uh, the, to bring us closer to nature and our natural potential. So, so Vivo's vehicle for innovation is footwear, um, and those three kind of driving factors can be applied to really any industry, but our our, our vehicle is obviously footwear. Um, we've just done a, we, we, we're, we're still learning. Everything we're doing, we're still learning. We, we will be the first business to put our hands up and say, you know, we tried, we tried our best. This is how far we've got. Um, you know, we've got a lot more work to do. Uh, and I think that it's that openness and that transparency for us to, to really, you know, admit when we've failed um, is a wonderful thing. And I think it can be, you know, celebrated. We've got a, we've got an, actually an award internally that is, uh, celebrates the, you know, the, the year's kind of, biggest failure almost, but it's not that. It's, it's basically where a project where tons of energy has gone in to try and change things for the better. Again, it might be, usually it's based on sustainability because everything usually does come back to that for us. But, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a failure. It's a learning. All of this is a learning process. But um, yeah, ultimately there's the, it's to, everything is to reconnect, uh, reconnect back to nature, right? And that's, that, that's, if you boil it all down, that's pretty much it. From the, from the product team and sustainability in the product team specifically, uh, we've just been on a pretty intense two year learning uh, journey with our development partner out in Vietnam. Um, a vast amount of work has gone in from our team and theirs across the board to try and consolidate our existing range down um, to be you know, more manageable in terms of what the materials are, what the processes are, who the suppliers are, so I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but the, the kind of um, notion at the beginning was like sustainable footwear isn't good enough. We want to move to this regenerative phase. And the only way we can do that is to simplify down, um, consolidate as much as we possibly can. So we've got a more manageable toolbox of materials, manageable supply chain. Um, all of that then feeds into the, um, what, what one of our biggest success stories from last year is that we become a B Corp. So we scored 98.8 out of 200. I'm told that that's a really good score. I don't really know much about it, to be fair, but I'm told it's a wonderful score. Apparently, it's the highest footwear brand score in the industry, which is, you know, a huge celebration for us. Um, and, you know, it's just one celebration story, one champagne moment, let's say, of, of this, this wider kind of sustainable journey that we're on. Yeah, and you, and you sort of touched on the transparency bit uh, you touched on why there's all of this focus on both nature and regenerative sort of angle to the product design, but maybe you can expand on this to say sort of what are the ideas that have inspired some of this work, um, both for you and the company. Really. Yeah, so um, everything, everything we do from a product perspective is always feet first, right? We, if we, we, we've got these kind of really free key overarching principles that we cannot stray from, and they give us really key uh, kind of design barriers to work within. So all of our shoes are wide, thin and flexible to allow your feet to be um, as uh, behave as naturally as they possibly can. So to bring them back to their you know, kind of healthy state, let's say. So everything starts with feet first. And then after that, it depends on the brief. So every brief has its own set of use cases. Who's it for? What's it being used for? So once you've got those kind of uh, boundaries, you can then start looking at where your inspiration comes from. So two examples I wanted to share today was um, We've got a, a collection that's slowly building and will continue to be released called the ESC, Extreme Survival Collection. We released a shoe last year called the Tempest, and that was inspired by um, by aquatic uh, organisms because the shoe, the use case, was designed for swim run. So if you're doing a do a shoe for swim run, the instant like reaction is to go, let's look to nature to find where how nature would come up, overcome some of these potential problems we're going to have to be faced with. So water drainage, flexibility, strength, protection, all of these kind of things. So we looked to coral, we looked to leaf structures, we looked to um, patterns on fish even to see how we can build in this process to simplify the shoe um, and build in all of these properties. 
uh, which I think was, well, personally, I thought was a really, really amazing project to be to be working on. Um, so yeah, every project has its different space, different angle, and you need to know what the project is trying to do, uh, who's it for, what's it going to be used for, to, to build out where the inspiration starts to get layered on. Um, so that's one example of like a performance shoe. Um, we've got a whole host of other shoes coming out in, in the future that are in this space. But then a kind of flip side of that, where they're maybe like less techie is, uh, we, we make shoes in Ethiopia. We've got a kind of um, a factory set up over there in partnership with a leather company called Pittards. And the use case is very different. So um, the, the factory over there doesn't have all the machinery that you'd get in, say, Asia. So the approach has to be different. You can't, you don't have this plethora of, of opportunity and potential, try this, try that. So instantly your, your barriers are, are, are tightened, which means you have to be more creative about what you do. So the approach for a shoe in Ethiopia is very different from approaching for a shoe in Vietnam. So in Ethiopia, we have our own, our whole set of uh, predetermined kind of approaches. So um, circular economy principles are almost embedded in that because you're literally limited to um, levers, a bit of rubber, simple processes. So inherently, you know, things are stitched together so they can be designed to be disassembled. They can be designed to be really simple. They can be designed in certain ways where pieces can be repaired, for example. So linking into that, we launched uh, last year a program called Revivo, um, which is our own kind of re-commerce site where we're taking back shoes that have either been sent back to us by customers at the end of their life or shoes that have failed, for example. So we've got this, this other piece where we can repair shoes, give them a new lease of life, refurbish them and whatnot. So yeah, depend, going back to the beginning of the question, it really depends on where your inspiration comes from. It depends on what the shoe will be for, where it will be made, what are the kind of um, restriction factors for the process. And then on top of that, you just layer and layer and layer pieces together. Okay. Um, and I mean, you mentioned these processes and how they sort of really, you know, have to be fit for purpose, right? And if you, if you sort of reflect on this with the challenges that 2020 has brought, um, what has that really changed for, for Vivo or for the industry overall? Yeah, so, I mean, it's obviously been a, a mental year for everybody. Um, and, and, you know, we have, we have been extremely fortunate, in all honesty, um, going into the pandemic. So we, as a business, were 80% we were direct customer online um, anyway. So, so we, were, we were almost more prepared for a physical shutdown than, than most. So we were... We do count our blessings in that space, um, but at the same time, it brings huge challenges, but also huge opportunities. So, you know, there, there are lots of pieces to this puzzle. You know, there's, um, there's, there's, there's a whole piece around strengthening and diversifying the supply chain, making sure that we're, you know, not all of our eggs aren't in one basket. So Ethiopia is one example of that. We also make shoes in Portugal, um, building out this piece. And then there's other pieces that we're looking to in the future for uh, focusing on localized manufacture. So there's a bunch of like opportunities there that, that have been almost highlighted even further from, you know, the effects of, of what we've been through. Um, and then other opportunities in this space are obviously digitization of the process. So we can't travel. One of the best things about being a footwear designer is you can go across, you know, we, we fly to Asia probably four to six times a year, eat some lovely food, meet some wonderful people, mess around in factories, trying to figure out problems and, you know, oh, life's so difficult. But, you know, it's a wonderful way to live. And I really do miss that. But we can't do that anymore, right? Or at least not as freely as, as we could. So we've had to really double down on, and, and focus on digitization. So trying to build our own internal digital um, processor to be a little bit more robust. We can't, we can't sit around a table and sketch like we used to. Everything we, we're doing has to be the only time we have on Zoom. We want that or, or Teams or whatever. You want that time to be as rewarding as possible. So we're having to build in more process from our side to make sure that the time we spend together is more effective. So we're looking at things like um, not just Illustrator and normal sketch programs that you do, but we're now looking at uh, you know virtual reality, for example, working with the guys over at Gravity Sketch uh, to try and figure out ways where we can get that piece of um, human interaction back and back into the process that we've we've you know has been torn away from us. So I think there's a lot there's there's it's, it's quite easy to look at the previous year and go, oh God, it's been crap. I can't wait for everything to return to normal. But actually, lots of opportunities are starting to arise. 
Um, and I think we should, we, you know, we shouldn't just put them to one side when the world does open back up. We, we should see this as an opportunity to, to simplify, progress further forward um, and ultimately use it for, a, for positive good for all of us. Yeah, um, and and sort of this opportunity bit is something you brought up, and I know I know you you already mentioned about digitization, but I I also knew you have other favorites sort of in the innovation space, and what what technologies do you think will really be at the forefront of this transition or this brave new world as this event is team? Yeah, so I, I think I think for myself, I mean, I was I was thinking about this a lot um, over the last few days, and I think there's kind of two straight two streams to it in my mind at least, and they're they're not by no means the only strands, but they're just two that I've been or we at Vivo have been focusing on, and and first one I touched on a moment ago was was about supply chains, so building robust supply chains. Um, the world as we know it has just been turned on its head. I don't think anybody thought that that was possible, um, but you know, evidence has shown a complete opposite. So making sure that we've got a, a robust supply chain that if, you know, all of a sudden one tap gets turned off, we're not completely in, you know, in the, in the mess um, and vice versa. So yeah, just making sure that that piece is, is really solid, stable. We can be more agile. We can be more reactive. Um, and we're going to hear from and wider and wider and wider later on today. And I think there's, there's some lovely times and to, to what they're trying to do about connecting the whole supply chain, almost like creating like a circular system. So, I'm really interested to hear a little bit more about that because ultimately people are at the heart of everything we do and um, people from the beginning of the project and from the manufacturing line and development end all the way through to people buying shoes so everything's connected through people so how do we how do we use technology to 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 improve and and, and make that process more efficient and the other the other section i want to talk about is the customer facing technologies so as i said these are only two strands that are on my mind at the moment but um you know, we're all we're all living and working at home and interacting with humans digitally. There's only so long really that this can last before we start to see stresses and whatnot. So, you know, hopefully a lot of you out there have seen the Netflix documentary, The Social Dilemma, focusing on like, you know, how being in this digital space just can't, you know, isn't really healthy for us, especially if it's driven by factors that aren't people positive. So a big thing we throw around in Vivo almost hourly is healthy digital. So what does healthy digital look like for Vivo? So how do we plug into this world that people know, Instagrams, Facebooks and whatnot? But how do we do it in a way that's not just feeding the big boys more and more money? How do we do it in a way that's got human centric values first? And I think that that, that sort of thinking of humanizing, uh, putting humans at the center of everything we do going forward um, will be a, yeah, it's a massive opportunity in this brave new world. Hope that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Um, thank you for that. So you, you did mention two strands. Um, I also want to go back to when you mentioned Revivo. Um, I think at the end of life, sort of the shoe industry specifically has sort of like open concerns. Um, maybe if you could just share some of some light on those challenges or some like initiatives in that space. Yeah, I mean, end of life management of a shoe is just not easy. There's, it's just the part and parcel of it, right? You, if you design shoes to be easily disassembled, easily recycled, then, then great. But you know, you've already made, if you're not making every single shoe like that, you've got maybe 90% of your range or, or even for some company, 99% of your range. So it, you've got all these challenges of, you know, messy shoes coming back that can't really be dealt with. So yeah, there's a lot of challenges going on there. I mean, for us, Revivo is, is a wonderful kind of hub. Everything goes back to that one hub. We can repair, we can refurbish, we can disassemble, we can grind down for recycling. So it's, for us, the Revivo is kind of like the heart of this end of life hub for us. And we're, we're, we're continuing to plug more partners in, whether it be people like Fast Feet Grinded um, into this space to, to, to grind shoes down at the end. But then there's another strand to this where we're looking into additive manufacturing. So a big, a big project we've got on at the moment is looking at um, bespoke kind of made to measure footwear using foot scanning as, as an initial input tool, going through all the whole process into, into you know, final products. And, um, that for us is really, really interesting because if you can print shoes, um, you know, whether it be one piece or component tree or whatever it might be, you can plug all these different things together and make it ultimately a very simple shoe by design, hopefully out of mono materials or very limited materials. So it makes that end of life um, process a lot easier. For us though, what's really interesting about that is because it is, is, is this kind of full circle returns how shoes 
were always made for millennia. So in indigenous communities and in tribal communities today, if you rewind time back, everybody's shoes were bespoke. You had a you had an, a, someone in your community or someone in your family that would make your shoes for you. They would be made for your feet by local materials, uh, and they would be you know literally discarded of after, but they would be made of local natural materials that could be that could go back to the earth. For us, additive manufacturing is a, is an example where we can kind of tap into that almost um, prehistoric man piece, but bring it into the into like the modern world. So shoes being made foot by foot person by person with a key restart or, or a simple recycling end of life solution at the end. So, I mean, additive manufacturing is one tool, but it is just a tool. Um, but for us, it's always, again, it, how do you reconnect that back to people? We could quite happily go and do, uh, you know, space shoes and blah, 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 and lots of exciting, like innovative kind of stuff like that. But really it's gotta be feet first. It's got to be kind of people positive and planet positive and that's that's the kind of road we're going down here okay i mean that process sounds like quite a journey yeah um, thank you for that and i think that's where we sort of come to my last question uh, which is really what do you feel needs to change in the industry uh, what are the impacts that could have yeah um it's a big question and i've tried i mean same as one of my other questions earlier i think there's there's so many strands to this but i just tried to like really simplify it down for just as you know to one point really and i think for me it, it, you know, it all comes down to idea sharing so platforms like fashion for good are wonderful right you're bringing together cross industry um professionals and startups and students and everything all together to one place and it's literally just a hub for people to come and share ideas so it's that approach that's wonderful um there's lots and lots of um more and more talk coming out about creative commons as well like where the idea sharing platform like can you can can there be idea like genuinely idea sharing platforms to come together and almost like a um yeah just wait it's just like a database really to share ideas i guess i don't really know how it really works but i love the idea of creative commons it keeps getting brought up in meetings and the more i hear about it the more I'm like, oh it sounds really cool but then a, a complete um stop to that is 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 honest it's ip so IP in the world of sustainability for me is a complete nonsensical idea. So companies generally are, are rated on profit, turnover, da, 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 da. Oh, and we hold X amount of patents, X amount of IP. And that's great. That's fine. You know, technology wouldn't exist and we wouldn't be where we are with that and inventors need that stuff. So that's great. The second there's pieces of IP that specifically link to sustainable solutions, e.g. I don't know, this, any shoe made of mono materials or any car made with uh, lithium ion battery, for example, you're just shutting the door on in the industry. Okay. There can be negotiations to open those doors and all of that sort of stuff. But in, you know, if it's for the planet's good, what, what, how can we make that um, process a little bit easier? So that's something I fight with myself on, on like regularly every week, really. I don't really know what the answer is, but it does grind on me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, I think we did end on a bit of strong note there. Um, but thanks so much for that, Lee. And some of the points you did mention were super valuable. I think we will bring, bring some of them back in the Q&A later. So thanks again for joining us today. Um, cheers. cheers. And we have now moved to our next segment um, where I'd like to introduce some of the innovators who are also on the call and let them tell us a bit about their innovation sort of before they move on, before we move on to our discussion. Um, so first, I'm excited to have Yazan from Swatchbook on the call, and they built this beautiful business that is digitizing materials and building out a library, enabling brands to explore, visualize, and share these materials. Um, but I think I'll leave the rest for you to hear about more from him. So over to you, Yazan. Awesome. Thank you, Karan. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah. All right. And I will say it's uh, it's a bit early here. It's, a, it's before 5 a.m. So if I'm blabbering and, and the words don't make sense, that's it's completely okay. Um, so thank you for uh, the introduction. Um, the easiest way to describe what Swatchbook is all about is if you make products, you need materials. If you need materials, come to Swatchbook. That's fundamentally our, our vision here. Um, we're both material sourcing and management cloud platform. We focus on soft good materials, primarily in the fashion space. Um, it's really a tailored experience that provides you a visually rich uh, content to look at from a design perspective. And when we say design, it's really anybody in the design process, not just designers, right? Product development, sourcing, and things of, uh, of that nature. 
Um, there's a variety of challenges uh, in our industry today, uh, slow and manual processes for decision making through uh, physical samples, uh, disconnection within the supply chain, unfor unforeseen disruption. Obviously, COVID has been uh, a, a wrench in everybody's gears. Um, but specifically for materials, you know, materials uh, had material shows canceled, slash budgets, working from home. That means every supplier has to connect to every designer specifically, um, increased lead times. Um, this has been uh, something I think that has been boiling and COVID just kind of amplified it uh, in the industry. For the most part, this is what designers look at today uh, when they are looking at materials, primarily spreadsheets, mostly text information, and very little visuals, and certainly not connected to any of the digital tools that they're utilizing um, within 3D or 2D design. So it's not really a very designer-centric uh, tool. And with Swatchbook, what we're trying to do is provide faster to market tools uh, to make decisions vir uh, virtually, uh, better insight into data and color, um, and Obviously, our uh, goal is for 3D e-commerce, which a lot of the brands are already on a journey to get there, meaning that they want to move from a design, make, uh, sell to a design, sell, and then make, which is obviously a, a better way to go. I want to show you kind of what it looks like to look at materials inside of Swatchbook. So we have a variety of different ways. And again, the idea is to provide as much visual uh, content as possible. So we have material roles, one-to-one -one thumbnails, and then full 3D. Uh, the material library itself is pretty straightforward. You look for tags, we find results, you download them, you share them, you organize them. Um, it's really meant for you to curate your library uh, that's, uh, that, you're searching, uh, that you're searching for. Uh, the materials themselves are showcased on like the swatch thumbnails and the drape thumbnails, but also more importantly for suppliers is that they can actually say what type of product will they see these materials on. It's like going to a material show, but it's magical. You can see a, phys a virtual sample of that material directly. And the idea is I can, don't have to know 3D, I don't have to be technical, I can just say, hey, this material's for this type of product. We basically find that product for you and then you could see that and everybody sees that uh, in their own way. Uh, we also showcase things like videos and uh, photos. The idea isn't that one technology is better or anything like that. It's really just to consolidate all these different technologies together to provide the best user experience possible. Um, getting some sense of what it looks like to have that material within your hands, in addition to everything you would see in a spreadsheet like uh, MOQ, lead time, and, and things like that. Um, and we do showcase other types of products, not just the fabrics and textiles, but also things like elastics and trims and webbings and uh, even hardware. And the idea, again, is to see what, those, what do those materials and products look like within context. So we work very closely with suppliers to make sure they're digitized, but then they're also, you're, you're able to see what they look like uh, directly there as a designer. I don't, I don't need to be modeling hardware or eyelets or anything like that. Everything comes in um, directly made. And we organize everything into collections. It's, it's how we curate that library. These can be raw material collections or a combination of materials, colors, com uh, graphics. Um, we also have a marketplace of amazing materials that are uh, all digitized, coming in from the supply chain, ready to go for a virtual uh, workflow. Karan, if I go over, uh, if I get close to being done with my five minutes, let me know. <laughs> um, okay. We also have a digitization uh, center. We actually have now uh, three digitization centers globally. Uh, that can give you all these different uh, uh, digitization services. So from scanning to measurements, if you're working in uh, apparel to video to photo to different color variations to metadata, that to us is the digital swatch. And the idea again is to cut down on physical samples, which constitute a lot of waste for the, uh, for the environment, for time um, and for the industry and replace those with virtual, which are a lot faster to create and also a lot more iterative um, in that. These are some yes, key- uh, yeah, Sorry. Yeah. No worries. Any the line, yeah. All right. Uh, what, is it one minute left or done? Yeah, yeah you can just like finish a couple uh, of lines. Yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah, so we have a bunch of different tools. I'm gonna just kind of skip, skip through. These are on our YouTube channel. You guys can check them out, but basically ability to capture on your phone directly within 30, 20 to 30 seconds, you can go there, put some smart tags and see that design directly on a product in 3D, in AR. Um, I'm gonna skip a couple of these. <laughs> They're all there. They're really cool. Um, QR codes, uh, integration and all of that. But you can see the quality of the materials that are coming out of here. 
you know, the idea is I can make as a designer a decision on if this is the right material for my product. And for, for us, the most important thing beh behind all of this is to get to a single source of truth that starts with a supplier. It's a live link that goes into things like PLM and into visualization. But also if I need sustainability, I'm connected directly to the supplier uh, uh, along this. These are founders um, of Swatchbook, uh, Thomas Sinnery and myself. We're based in California. Our team is about 30 people. We're founded in 2017. We've got a couple of resellers and service centers. Some of our clients, we've got 140 enterprise suppliers on board. Um, and these are some of the partners that we work with. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Yazan. You're Very exciting stuff. Um, and I think next up we have Nordshu. So let, um, they're a company that's revolutionizing antimicrobial and antiviral coating. And we have with us Christopher. Um, and maybe you can take us through how your solution is disrupting the alternatives in the space. Absolutely. Um, let's see here, try to share, share my screen. Stop, sure that it works. Okay, yeah, it's up. Is, and that's all good? <clears throat> all good. Uh, Karan, thanks for, uh, for inter uh, inviting us and uh, giving us the, the opportunity of, of introducing ourselves. It's a, it's a pleasure. Um, we, I often get get a question from from people who who are really not that uh, that used to working with anti antimicrobial solutions. That well, what what is Nordshield all about, and what's what is so special about you guys, and why why are you doing what you're doing? And um, they're basically they're right. I mean, uh, antimicrobial solutions have been been around for for ages. Um, we've seen them in. Um, in, in a vast amount of different applications. But um, what, we, what we do is uh, <clears throat> we dis disrupt the, the old, old standards by actually having a uh, natural-based, sustainably produced and, <clears throat> sorry, and uh, biodegradable uh, product and, and technology that, that we're, we're offering. Um, in other words, if I look at, at what, we, what we have at hand is um, we, we've actually developed a technology which is uh, providing the exact same efficacy that, that, uh, that we're used to when we talk about antimicrobial solutions, but we we're doing it without the uh, ecological downsides. So that's, that's obviously, that's obviously a, a tremendous, tremendous upside uh, and added value. So and that, as I've, I've said a couple of, of times before, we we have the privilege of working with with nature as as our partner. So if you if you have a technology which is based on nature, um, you're you're aware of that and you're you're very very aware of the fact that it's uh, it's been diligently tested and and over over quite quite some time as well. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. Um, what we've what we've come up with is is basically a solution that um, we we are able to combine the best of two worlds. We have both the naturality and uh, and the efficacy, and um, we're quite quite alone up up in that segment. The applications that uh, that we we have and that we're working with is uh, well the application possibilities are will be. They're almost endless, um, which obviously is um, is a challenge itself. But on the other hand, uh, if you if you look at at the possibilities that we we have at hand, that also means that we're we're really in a position where we can we can actually make a, a, a real difference. So we're not only affecting one area, but but we are are in a position of um, of combining several areas and making making a, a very very big impact. Um, what we've done so far is, uh, or the current setup that we work with is, uh, is mainly focusing on, on three different uh, product categories. We have the fiber applications, uh, which is a water, water based solution. Uh, we have our brilliant series, with, which is ethanol based. And then we have, uh, have our more chill clear structure or bat, uh, product family. Uh, what is most relevant, obviously, for uh, for the fashion industry is uh, our water-based uh, water-based um, 
fiber application. And um, we, we started out with, with focusing on identifying a solution and optimizing a solution for, for treating, uh, treating mold, which is, uh, which is a, a big issue within, within the fashion industry, both within uh, warehousing and, and transportation. But obviously when we look at, at the current, um, current world that we live in, uh, the antibacteri antibacterial and antiviral uh, opportunities or effic efficacy opportunities are, are getting, getting more and more space. Um, when we started North Shield in, in about 2016, end of 2016, 2017, um, coming from, not from the, the fashion industry, um, I, I can I can be honest about really not having having an understanding about uh, about the the magnitude of the mold challenges that uh, that the fashion industry is uh, is facing. Um, on the other hand, I didn't understand either uh, how big an impact desiccants have on uh, on the environment and what actually happens to desiccants after after being being disposed after usage. And um, we've all, all known, or we are all aware of, uh, of the issues with, with plastic, but um, 160,000 plastic bags used per second globally, that was something that, that I, I wasn't very much aware of either. Um, not Chris, uh, of... I, think, I think we're out of time. So. <laughs> okay, you sure. can wrap up. Yeah. Um, but well, in in a nutshell, what we what we look at, uh, what we have at hand today, is um, is a solution which is um, uh, has has the possibility of, uh, of of really making a major major difference from a sustainability biodegradability point of view, to really work towards uh, the best tomorrow. All right. Um... Thank you so much for your thoughts, Christopher. That was lovely. Um, and we have our third innovator for today, Lee from, from Envider. Um, would love for you to tell us a bit more about how you and your team are really enabling brands to hear directly from workers about their lives and working conditions. Welcome. And over to you, Lee. Thank you, Karan. Um, I, fantastic. Thanks, Sophie. First, the poll. Thank you, very interesting, brilliant. <clears throat> so thanks for the invite, Karan and Sophie. Um, I'm quite close to Passion for Good on many levels. They're an investor in our business, but they've also been a fantastic source of support over the years. But <clears throat> just, just to start right at the beginning, I'm a data scientist. I've always specialized in designing systems to gather sensitive data from scared populations. So I used to work for, <clears throat> it's one of, one of the reasons why I have gray hair, I'm not the only one, but for 23 years on genocide and forced migration and violence affecting children. And then there was an incident on a platinum mine in South Africa back in 2012. And um, my attention was drawn to the kind of data gap on working conditions, which, which surprised me somewhat because of course workers, unlike the populations I've been working with previously, <clears throat> workers, uh, you know, with the exception of these mobile working um, working populations when it comes to trafficking um, and, and migrant labor, workers are largely, you know, located in a single geolocation and, you know, the, the best bit is that they have a mobile phone. Many, many workers today have a mobile phone in their pockets. <clears throat> so that's, that's a little intro into, into direct work reporting. Um, what direct work, work reporting is, is that you gather anonymous insight direct from workers at regular intervals about their working lives, in short. And why do we do that? 
primarily because there's a giant invisibility problem when it comes to working conditions and well-being. Um, and what we do is we make working conditions visible. How do we do that? Essentially, we've got an um, automated calling system. So it's a system whereby a client chooses the sites or geographies they wish us to cover with the monitoring. Um, we then push call cycles at regular intervals. The first call cycle is used to spot needs, gaps, urgencies, however you want to name them. And then subsequent call cycles are used to measure, to track improvement against those issues that workers have flagged. Um, the te technology itself and how it works, it's always a five minute call in the language of the workers choosing. The worker never uses their voice, never mentions their name. They simply press one for yes, two for no, three for don't know in response to 20 really simple, single, literal questions. So these are not questions about opinions or whether workers are content, because that depends on whether they've just had breakfast or gone to the toilet. These are, these are questions about what, what workers themselves have experienced and what they've, importantly, what they've observed others experiencing, because we're not naive in thinking that every worker answers every call. <clears throat> so every worker that answers our call calls becomes an eyewitness. But that data then lands on very simple to read traffic light da dashboards. Why the dashboards have to be so simple to read is that the employers have to see exactly what's needed on the back of each set of results. Um, so the dashboards, you know, at a glance, you can spot that every site or workforce covered is classified as either red, amber, or green. Red, obviously poor working conditions or an urgent situation, amber, mixed picture, and green, clean. These black sites are essentially sites that are in a holding pattern, you know, sites where the employers themselves are, are very nervous or there are some, some delays, which is important insight. So once you, once you start on your map, you can then click on, on the flags and, and the logic is, of course, that you, that you head for your red sites. That's where the priority lies. And then you compare between the red sites, essentially searching for the lowest scoring red because the site scores out of 10, the higher the score, the better the situation. So you, you head for the lowest scoring red and you get little summary boxes. This is the, this is the mid level of detail, which where you can see at a glance, the number of priorities, i.e. number of issues that workers have flagged as red and whether a site has made progress upwards or downwards. Um, much like startup life, you know, working conditions yo-yo. Um, you, seasonality happens in every production facility, no matter how ethical the supply chain and how ethical the employer. There are, there are kind of seasonal rises and falls. And, and so, you know, we, we coach our clients not to expect kind of um, rather naively a, a linear curve where you go from, from bad and get better and that's it. Um, and that's important. That's hence the reason why monitoring at regular intervals is so important. And then, once you've once you've gone to these um, to to the mid level of detail, you can click on any of those blue eyes and then eyeball the detail for a particular site. And on that site, you know one of the most important kind of insights is the priorities chart. And essentially, that's the chart that stipulates any issue that attracted a fifty percent or higher red from the workers who who answered the calls. And they always ranked from from you know, highest red to lowest red, i.e. it's a to-do list for the, for the employer and also a to-do list for the buyers concerned because of course, a lot of these issues are not, not only to be resolved by the supplier. Some of these are systemic issues that require collaboration. And then you've got a progress chart where at a glance, you can see whether a site has grown its greens and shrunk in its reds um, and whether the overall picture's changed, but you can always compare any part of our results with, with previous call cycles. Um, we're active in over 30 geographies. <clears throat> I'm always slightly out of date with this because my team kind of wraps me over the knuckles. But um, long story short, you know, I, I'm proud to say even in the Gulf now, that was our, our, biggest, um, our biggest untouched territory, but we know there as well. And, and we're active across four, four sectors, FMCG, apparel, construction, and early activity in, in energy. Um, so that's that's it. Um, just to just to start where I uh, to end where I started. Um, remote monitoring is not just about doom and gloom. It's not just about identifying where things are wrong or where working conditions are really poor or even where forced labor might be happening. 
it's importantly about measuring improvement and, and having you know, a data-based reason to celebrate. Um, so so that's, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. Um, and I think really all of you for sharing this with us. Um, and I think we can move into the discussion bit now. We have a bunch of questions already in, pre-submitted. And I'm probably gonna start with those. Um, but I encourage everyone to sort of keep dropping in the questions in the Q&A box. And if we can, we will sort of try to answer them. Um, I'd also like to bring back Lee, who's still here, but anyway. Um, we, we've covered a few solutions here. And I think I wanted to start talking about what, what ways these solutions really work within a circular lens sort of the environmental benefit that comes from embedding these solutions into the supply chain. Um, and maybe Yazan, you might want to take this first. Yeah, it's, I mean, with, within the supply chain, a lot of this, you know, a lot of the sustainability that we're seeing, even within um, what's happening, the, the samples are specifically for the ones that we tackle, right? Swatch samples and uh, product samples. Um, and the amount generated uh, uh, in terms of waste for that, and it's not just, you know, just the actual material, but the shipping that has to go through. So when you send a swatch, people don't think that this thing is going to have to get on, a, on a, some sort of tra uh, transport to get to me. So designers are always like, yeah, give me a swatches. You know, I want just more swatches. They've got a bunch of them and then a bunch of different copies of them. Um, but between the, the, the cover footprint of shipping those things around, the traveling that uh, a lot of the suppliers have to go through and carry two, two suitcases with them and go to every single um, uh, brand, that all adds up. Um, to give you just one, one example of just samples, uh, nothing more, one brand in 2014, I just remember that because I, I was working with them at the time, they went through 1.9 million samples a year. Um, this was one brand, not the largest. Um, and that, if you put that into, shipping containers and stack them up, it's four times the height of World, One World Trade Center. Uh, multiply that every single year with every single other brand and they're not the largest and it's only gotten worse and worse since then with fast fashion and things happening uh, and accelerating. So every product that you put on your, on your body has multiple samples created for it. Um, imagine the samples of the swatches and the materials all kind of multiplied. Thank you. Um, and Christopher, I think, you know, this will probably let you pick up on where I cut you off earlier, but would you want to sort of add on to what the problem is with existing sort of heavy metal based solutions and maybe just add on a button not you? The, uh, I think the main, main issue has, um, has obviously to do with the fact that it's not safe for, for the environment. So you're, you're talking about heavy metals, uh, they're non-renewable, uh, they leach into our nature and um, they cause sensitization and, uh, and irritation. So I think that's, that's one of the, the major, major issues or some of the major issues you have, have with the currently used uh, heavy metals. All right. Um, I think I also wanna extend part of this question to Leah. So, so why do brands really work with NYDA? Um, what are the key benefits for them in picking up the solution? So Karan, um, I'm going to start with the with the with the impact side because that's what interests me most. Um, it allows brands to to prioritize because supply chains are messy. Um, there are a lot of suppliers, you know, and and, and supply chains that are partially invisible. Um, these suppliers in different geographies, in different sub geographies, have different working conditions, and um, and the auditing system, the inspection system used to currently check in on working conditions and the likes. Um, the, the scheduling of audits happens in, in quite random ways. So basically, long story short, our system simplifies that picture by, by monitoring a whole bunch of sites, um, generating insight quite quickly and at a, a, you know, cost effectively and allowing brands and, and employers themselves and to see at a glance, you know, which sites are coded red, amber, green, and how those, those statuses have changed over time. Brands are benefit because they can investigate an issue. So when a scandal breaks or when, you know, when a problem, you know, arises and is reported, they need to know exactly what's, what the extent and nature of the problem is and how many workers are affected or how many sites are affected. And we do that too. And, and as mentioned earlier, we also track improvement, you know, the, because we're engaging the same workforces at regular intervals, we can very quickly see when something's being resolved or when, when the situation changes. But then finally, 
you know, the world is catching up in terms of legislation and due diligence um, in, in the US or California specifically, sadly not across the US, but, um, and in the UK and, and about to, to be across the EU, but, but also in France and Australia. We've seen waves of legislation focused on, on, on obligating brands to do due diligence and, and identify dress and prevent exploitation and, and forced labor. And so brands have to report on what they're doing um, and systems like ours, you know, benefit them in the sense that they have a system in place to do that for them. Um, and those sort of uh, very cool points, I think, bring me to my next question. Uh, where there's really all of this sort of amazing innovation happening in the world of fashion. And maybe Lee, you could attempt to answer this because this was sent in uh, beforehand. What, what, why are these current solutions really still on the market? Um, what are the challenges bringing on some of these innovations into the supply chain? Um, I, I, I think Leah kind of mentioned it there that it's complicated, right? It's, it's complex. The supply chain is, you know, you, you can, if you started a brand from scratch, had a blank, a blank kind of sheet of paper, then it'll be a lot less, it'll be a lot easier because you could put all these processes in at once, but the world isn't as black and white as that. Um, everything needs to be done almost retrospectively, but you know the first part of it is is identifying and having the tools to identify where the problems lie. So you know processes like from and wilder, for for example, allow you to just really quickly and, and I guess really effectively zoom in on a problem, identify the problem, and then tasks can be put in place uh, around it specifically. And 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 that's that's a, should be the same approach for any part of just innovation in general. Like what are you trying to solve? Um, and ultimately, there's just tools out there. All the, all the things we've spoke about today are, are just tools, right? They're not they're not the end solution. They're tools to get to a better place. Um, and it might be from a digital perspective, it might be from a supply chain or, or an antibacterial perspective. But it's just tools that we, we we can use and lean on in a variety of different combinations to to yeah to solve problems as a whole. And, and for me, it goes back to that that kind of human first sort of sharing piece that I touched on before is, you know, the more that we can collaborate cross industry and as well as outside of the industry, there's lots to be learned outside of fashion, right? You can, if you just looked at the automotive world for one, for, you know, selfishly from my perspective, there's so many things that we could learn from there and or cross pollinate and improve their industry and, and, and you know, back into fashion. And you can take that from any industry. So I think there's, um, there's a lot to be said about cross pollination um, and collaborative work. A little bit of a fluffy answer, apologies for that, but. Right, um, and in sort of talking about these challenges to scale, I think that was another question, all pretty similar, but the, um, is there something sort of Yazan you'd like to add on to that in terms of um, really barriers to scaling up the solution um, or even Christopher, if you want to jump in after. I mean, I'll, I'll start with, 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 what we're trying to achieve digitally, I think from a scale up perspective, from a supplier perspective, the idea is to provide better insight into how the content is used um, and make the net wider in terms of it's not just about the brands using the digital, it's uh, the digital aspect. It's really the suppliers, it's also the manufacturers, it's even the marketing agency. Um, right now, so much redundant work happens all the time without anybody kind of being connected um, in any of it. So when you create a physical sample, that's the brand making a decision or the supplier making a decision. But if you're making uh, a, you know, a, a commercial, the agency has to do work to get that stuff also digitized in some sense. The factories work on their own uh, kind of silo. What we're trying to provide a single, is a single source of truth that travels around everybody's uh, kind of uh, work. Um, and then the supplier has a better insight into how that data is used. You know, if, if the, a lot of times when we talk to suppliers, they have no insight into how they're, you know, until the order comes in, they have no real, no real clue about what's happening by providing some uh, in terms of, uh, and even, even afterwards, they're actually not tracking it, which is phenomenally uh, shocking to us. Um, but by understanding, you know, what's trending, what are people using, uh, the, the suppliers, they, they end up, you know, making less physical stuff um, that they hope that's going to work by, you know, having better insight into what's working today. Uh, Christopher, anything to add? Okay. Uh, 
um, looking at, at it from, from our perspective, I mean, obviously the, uh, the current situation has, I think it's, it's changed um, our way of, of working towards, uh, actually it's, it's more of a balance between uh, balancing the uh, challenges around ecological, uh, the ecological footprint and actually the, uh, the well-being of, of, of consumers. And um, that is, uh, is clearly seen in, in all the discussions that we have with, with our, uh, our partners that uh, the whole antimicrobial uh, world is, uh, is very much, uh, has very much changed and the, uh, the attitude towards that. So it's, uh, the current situation has definitely uh, created a lot of awareness, which I believe is going to be, uh, be seen for, for quite some time also after, after this pandemic. So we'll, we'll definitely work we're definitely living, living in, a, in a very, very different world than, than we did earlier. Right, and you, you mentioned sustainability, and I think I'm trying to try and squeeze in a question here before we close. Um, but the question always comes as to how do we measure progress here? Uh, and this was another question that came in the chat, but what sort of metrics do we see as most relevant um, to ultimately achieve sustainability in the industry? Um, and I'd like Lee to answer this first, and maybe as a, as a follow-up to that, Leah, you could jump in on the metrics bit, I think you've been satisfied with that. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm a little less connected to the metric side of it. We've got a very highly talented team in Vivo, which are focused on you know, just sustainability and regenerative practices alone. So I wouldn't really want to speak too, too far out of turn, but I think metrics wise, it's just uh, for us, when we, when we started to apply for B Corp, for example, just as one example of, of many things that are being done in, in house is you, 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 you kind of, you sign up to something, you say, this is the way we're going to put our flag in the sand. And then it gives everybody a, a direction to all mobilize towards whatever that metric might be. It just gives you a, a, a kind of common marching goal. Um, so B Corp as one example meant that, you know, a cross-functional team across the business had to spring up because if we didn't meet it, then we were going to fail on that objective. And what it did, it just, it just kind of supercharged um, the process running through. So can't really specifically talk about metrics because I don't know them in all honesty, but yeah, I think, I think just having a common goal in anything you do, um, and especially in this space where it is very complicated, it is very messy. There's so many things that, that need to be solved and, and that can have knock-on effects. You know, one decision of, oh, this material is better than this material, actually at the end of life, it might cause havoc in, in, in a way that you, you didn't foresee. So yeah, just having a, a common goal, people in the business that, that, that know what, the goals are constantly and you can go and check back and, and can educate essentially educate circular circulate education through the business and um, it's key so really my my view on that is just yeah having a team and a goal all working in the same direction thanks lee and my input would be um you know we need to we need to measure what matters um sometimes in the sustainability sector we've been a little bit lazy on that We've been tending to, to measure process rather than outcomes. So, you know, we have to keep focus on the ball with metrics. And, and if, the, if, if the end game is to um, improve circularity and improve workers' lives, we measure that and we keep measuring it. We, we design the metrics beautifully so that it's very practical and easy to measure. And then it ticks over quietly in the background. And then the secret source is to make the data visualization, to make the kind of results along the way motivating, not discouraging. So frame them in such a way that it's always a race to the top. You know, whether you're competing with yourself, that's first prize, or whether you're competing with others, share results such that, you know, you, you, er, everyone's encouraged to, to, to improve their game and improve their game relative to, to, to the average performance. And it works beautifully. You know, none of us like getting le left behind, but we also, none of us like regressing. So, so it does motivate efforts if the data is strong and the way that data is shared is motivating. Thank you for that, Leah. Um, and, I, and I think we are extending by a couple of minutes. I hope everyone's still happy with staying on the line. Um, and I wanted to ask each of you in closing, sort of just a, a small question as to like, what is it that really gives you hope uh, for the fashion industry? Um, and maybe Lee, you could start and sort of just nominate the next person to go after you and sort of come a couple of lines. Uh, yeah, uh, what gives me hope? I, I guess forums like this um, make me hopeful. I mean, there was what, 80 plus people on this call today. 
you wouldn't be attending this call if you wasn't interested to you know to, to make the world a better place in some way and through this lens of fashion so yeah sharing and platforms such as this give me hope uh, i'm going to pass the torch to yasan um i think you know i have to say you know with covid and the all the terrible losses that it's done um it amplified and accelerated the re the need for change um and I think while it's, it's, it's sad to say that it took this much to, for it to happen, it's happened. For us, at least, we're starting to see a lot of the, the brands just kind of wake up and say, well, this, wasn't, this isn't something we're going to solve in two to three years or even longer. It's something we have to do now. That gives me hope that, you know, the, this kind of spark the fire that hopefully will continue um, to, to shine a light on, on how broken the supply chain truly is um and the process not just the supply and the supply chain uh, but so I, I think we're seeing a lot of positive change we're going to see that reflected uh in the next couple of years in terms of uh the effect on the industry so that that definitely uh, and certainly what uh, lee had said uh, resonates really well i will nominate um uh, leah sorry the classic the classic zoom fail of forgetting to unmute um, I, I'm encouraged, you know, sometimes crisis um, drives agility. Um, and and I'm, I'm impressed by, by the kind of level of agility that, that brands and, and supply businesses have started to show because of the crisis. Um, and agility means, you know, more open minds, because at the end of this all, you know, it's all about people, as Lee was saying earlier. Um, and, and in unprecedented times when all our lives have changed overnight and we've seen global change at a pace that none of us would ever have imagined, recognizing that the world can change this fast and can, the world can change you know, fundamentally, you know, personally as well as collectively this fast gives me a huge amount of hope. And with it has, has come kind of cha a change in corporate behaviors and, a, and, a, and, a, and an embrace of data in uncertain times, which is also, of course, very encouraging for, for our business. Over to Christopher. Thank you. Um, over the past, uh, past one and a half years, uh, what we've experienced is that, uh, especially from, or both from brands, reg uh, regulators and uh, authorities and, and, uh, and, and, and consumers, customers, uh, the, the request and um, thrive for a change in, uh, in making sure that uh, the whole fashion industry is actually moving towards what the main brands already have been, been working off, on for, uh, for several years is, uh, is getting more and more obvious. And uh, I think that's, um, that's a tremendously, tremendously positive, positive sign. And um, there is uh, there is a clear initiative from if you if you look at at the phasing out of um, of the currently used used biocides, um, especially having Sweden and Germany as as front runners. That in combination with uh, with the people actually making the changes, and uh, the brands collaborating more and more, which uh, which has been a very positive surprise to me, uh, is a clear indication that there is uh, there is a true will in making making a change and. Uh, that is, is something that I, I see see highly positive. Hi, so thank you. Um, thank you for that, Christopher. And I'd like to really thank all of our speakers here today for sharing your knowledge with us. Um, and for people who join us on the call, I mean, I hope this is an informative session for all of you. Um, we wish you all the best and we hope we see sort of more innovations like this changing uh, the face of the industry. Um, so have a nice rest of the day. And be sure to keep an eye on our website and social media for upcoming FFG events. Um, and thank you so much for joining us again.